Good afternoon and welcome to the Live Wire, UNC Charlotte's forum for conversations with newsmakers from here on campus and beyond. I'm Will City. The shooting of unarmed black teenager Michael Brown by a white police officer in Ferguson, Missouri in August of 2014 was the first in a series of flashpoints in a now running debate over whether the American justice system is equitable to all of its citizens. And though the officer in that case was cleared of wrongdoing, a Justice Department report concluded wide disparities in arrest in Ferguson resulted at least in part from an unlawful bias in stereotypes about African Americans. Separate investigations have found similar bias in courtrooms, police departments, and school systems nationwide. Revealing these inequities, understanding their causes, and driving community discussion are the first steps in dealing with them. UNC Charlotte social work professor Susan McCarter is a leader of those efforts in our community through her research on disproportionality in the justice system and public outreach with the group Race Matters for Juvenile Justice. Dr. McCarter exposes some harsh realities but also reveals some promising solutions. She joins us in studio today to discuss both. Dr. McCarter, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. So to begin, let's define what we're talking about here. What do we mean when we say that there's a disproportionality in the American justice system? Well, my, my research students would be really happy that you ask that question. Um, it gives us a chance to get on the same page and operationalize some terms. When we say disproportionality, that often gives things a bad rap. Disproportionality has become known as something bad. Um, when actually the word disproportionality just means things are out of proportion mathematically. Um, I have a fun little example that I'll use for you. Um, here's actually a definition from the Oxford Dictionary. Um, but I explain the term as if you're cooking cookies, you're baking some cookies. Um, if you are making chocolate chip cookies, I don't know if you like to put nuts in yours, but I put nuts in mine. So if your recipe calls for a cup of chocolate chips and a half a cup of pecans, and you are feeling particularly nutty, you might put in more nuts than chocolate chips. That would be a disproportionate amount of chocolate chips or nuts, depending on which ones you put in more of. And really that's all that the word means. When we translate disproportionality to demography or to the population, we expect a certain representation in a phenomenon that we might study. And when that phenomenon is disproportionate, it just means it doesn't reflect the population at the time or in the place. Right. The work that I do um, is focused on race and ethnicity and the demography around race and ethnicity. When you look at um, racial proportion, you first have to operationalize or define what race is. And so I like to use a Bobo and Fox citation that's a 2003 um, definition. And they tell us a couple things. They tell us first that race is a social construct. They tell us that it's not scientific. And they tell us that it depends on the history of the time and the location. So it's provisional, means it varies by time and context. So the way that you and I define race in America in 2015 is different than how they defined race in Greece at the turn of the century, for example. In 2010, the US Census Bureau um, did some work around standardizing racial and ethnic categories. So in 2010, um, the U.S. Census Bureau suggested that federal agencies define race in a couple ways. And they said you could be white, you could be black or African American, you could identify as Asian, you could be um, Native American or uh, Pacific, I mean, uh, or um, Alaska Native, you could be Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. Those were the options or the categories in 2010 census. So those are the ones that you'll see most often used. Um, when the U.S. Census Bureau at the same time looked at ethnicity, they recommend that federal agencies define um, ethnicity, which is um, groups of folks based on culture, religion, um, a common experience. And they suggest that for the U.S. Census in 2010 that you were either Hispanic or not Hispanic. And we see the, the term Latino um, 
included in that as well. But when, we, when I do research around um, race, we begin to talk around um, how many people are we talking about and what kinds of characterizations can we really make using these race categories. Um, so, if, for example, if Americans were to define or classify how many Asian folks there are in the world, there are about four billion people that we would consider to be Asian. I don't know that we can make a generalization about four billion people. Right. Um, likewise, another unique um, facet of the 2010 Census Bureau was that for the first time, um, United States gave you the option of identifying as multiracial. Now, I would make the argument that most of us are multiracial, right. but um, they gave folks the option to click the box that indicated they identify with two or more races. And actually, in the 2010 census, um, we have about 9 million people who chose that option. Um, so about 3% of the American population identified as two or more races. So I look at the overrepresentation or racial disproportionality is one of the things that, that I spend time um, examining. But one of the points um, that I think it's important to make is if I've just told you that race isn't scientific and we can't really make characterizations about all these people, then why should we continue to measure it? Why should it be important or salient to anyone's research? Um, and what I would suggest uh, as an answer to that is as long as people's outcomes vary um, based on this construct of what we call race, then my suggestion is we would continue to um, disaggregate data by race and ethnicity based on the outcomes that we're seeing. And, and I'm, I'm excited to talk to sure. you about some of those outcomes today. Do you think it's beneficial, though, for people to understand that about race, that it is dynamic, that it's something that changed, and that it's a social construct, not something based in scientific differences in people? Do you think that's a beneficial starting point for people who are going to have the discussion we're about to have today? Absolutely. Um, I think that's really important. And as I um, talk on this topic, um, give presentations and lectures in our community and, and in, in the nation, I'm continue, I continue to be struck by how many people suggest that there's a DNA um, connection to race or that um, folks can um, be, uh, you can test someone and, and identify them racially. Because I think, that, I think that's the best starting point for us to have. Um, that if you historically look at how race has been defined, um, it's been an in-group, out-group, um, that definition has shifted largely by the people that are making the definition up. So I think, I think you're exactly um, right that that's an important place to start. Um, I also like to start in this place, and, and you'll see that we have Lady Justice represented here. Um, she is often um, cited as embodying the institutional values. Um, so for, for the justice system, for example, um, she is obviously blindfolded. Um, she's holding scales in one hand and a sword in the other. And what, she's, what the expectation is, right, is that justice will be delivered kind of impartially without lady justice or the justice system evaluating what you look like or what kind of clothes you wear, what kind of car you drive, how much money your parents make, et cetera. Um, in addition, she's supposed to be able to use those scales in her left hand um, to evaluate the evidence, to judge your behavior the way that you've acted, um, and then use the sword in her right hand to levy a punishment based on the evidence. And this, th these are institutional values, not only for the justice system, but for other systems as well. Um, education system, for example, um, should be impartial to your um, demography, if you will, and then just judge you based on your behavior. Um, I would love to talk about some foundational research on this topic. Um, this was a study that I conducted in the Commonwealth of Virginia, 
and it highlights um, contact points in the juvenile justice system. So you can see here um, that a youth, that a young person is stopped, and that can occur on the highway, um, that can occur in the hallway of your school. Um, anytime someone stops you um, to ask you questions about your behavior or what's going on, then presumably that person has some power over you to make a decision. That person can choose to arrest you or not to arrest you. And that, that decision likely either tracks you into the juvenile justice system or, as we would call that, diverts you from the system. And some of the examples of options that people have for diversion, most people think about community service. Um, okay, you've, you've been um, charged with a certain crime, um, and so you can either go into the juvenile justice system or you can do 150 hours of community service, and then you won't have to go into the juvenile justice system. You're, you're what we call diverted. Um, the decision can be made whether or not to detain you, and that basically means once you're stopped, uh, you're not going home, you're going downtown, as we would say, right? Um, the next contact point is whether or not you're sent to juvenile court, um, and from that position, then you can be uh, tried and adjudicated. We either find you delinquent or not. Um, from there, you can be placed on probation. And then the final step um, in any system, in any state, is incarcerating young people. Um, and so what I did for this study is I looked at seven different variables um, in the state of Virginia. So studying the justice system, though, is not only about who ends up in the justice system. It's about how different groups move within the structure of that justice system because there can be disproportionality or disparity in that respect as well. Absolutely. And um, there are several studies that examine the, the different contact points I highlighted and whether or not disparity exists at each of those points. Think about, um, think about other systems that youth touch as well, um, and we'll talk about that some and the other systems that they touch. But in addition to dis disproportionality at different contact points, one thing that we've found in the juvenile justice system is a cumulative effect so that that disproportionality builds the more contact points you touch within the juvenile justice system. So what is this graph showing us? So this study um, was one that I conducted in Virginia, and I looked at seven variables that were presented in the literature. Um, there are two red ones, and then you can see five green ones. Those are all the, the independent variables in the study. And the two red uh, variables, which are crime severity, in other words, what type of crime you committed, did you shoplift or uh, did you rob someone at gunpoint, are measured on a standard crime severity ind indices, index. Um, the second legal variable um, is prior record, and that's the number of prior petitions that a young person would have, so how many times they picked up charges beforehand. These two are colored red because they're what we consider to be legal variables. If you think back to Lady Justice, these are the ones she's holding the scales, she's evaluating your behavior. So these are ones that, that youth can control um, and that reflect a young person's behavior. The other five are what we would consider to be extra legal variables. So the first that, there that you see is um, socioeconomic status. We measured that as a continuous variable um, examining family income. Education was measured as um, whether or not you had repeated a grade. In this study, ethnicity, um, we didn't have enough numbers for ethnic populations, so this study was just a black and white study, um, and it was a male-only study. We had very few um, females in the, in the population, in the um, juvenile justice population at that time. Geotype was whether or not you lived in an urban, suburban, or rural location. And you'll see this um, type of variable kind of ebb and flow in the literature. Um, there's conversations that, that I had last week in Charlotte around using zip code as a measure um, or an indicator of, of crime. Um, and then the final variable that we used was family structure. And we used 
I, wills, I think every family structure you and I together could come up with. We used um, father only, mother only, grandparent, uh, foster care, group home, um, you name it. We had lots of family structures involved in the study. And we measured these um, independent variables, these legal and extra legal variables, at two dependent variable levels. So when you think about the contact points in juvenile justice, we wanted to see who is more likely to be diverted or less likely to be diverted, and who is more likely to be incarcerated or less likely to be incarcerated. And looking at these seven variables, we found one predicted diversion. So which one do you think out of all of those variables might predict whether or not a young person is diverted? Well, you would hope it, was, it would be either prior record or crime severity because those are the things, again, that we say Lady Justice wants to be measuring. Exactly right. And you would be, in this instance, you would be exactly right. So the one variable that did predict whether or not a young person was diverted was the severity of your crime. In other words, if you committed homicide and you're charged with homicide, they're not giving you trash pickup on the side of the road. They're not letting you go home. You're going to be detained, held for court, etc. Now, we had a little bit of a different finding once we, and remember, we talked about the cumulative effect through those nine contact points. So diversion was close to the beginning of the contact points, and incarceration was the final stage. And what we found when we measured incarceration, that actually four of the seven statistically significantly predicted whether or not a youth would be incarcerated. Which is a more troubling statistic. Correct. Both of the legal variables, crime severity and prior record, predicted incarceration. However, the strongest predictor was one of the green ones. The strongest predictor of incarceration was the race of the young person. And then interestingly in this study, the second strongest predictor was also an extra legal variable, and that was education. So a lot of uh, conversation now around school to prison pipeline shows an intersectionality of education and race and juvenile justice. When, uh, when you begin to think about the contact points and the level of disproportionality, I've highlighted juvenile justice and we're actually going to dig in there in just a second. We'll also dig into education and some other systems. But one thing that I think um, our viewers will start to um, put together throughout this presentation is that disproportionality happens across systems. I like to highlight this, um, this film that's done out of Brave New Films, and, and you can um, just Google their, their site and their work. But they do this short video, it's about four minutes, and it highlights what this intersectionality looks like for two people of different races. Um, and the neat thing for students about this um, is at the end of it, they provide the links for all of the studies that were included in, in the film. So, what do you say now we look at some data and we'll look at North Carolina specifically, um, but what I like to do is be able to look at North Carolina in the context of the U.S. So we'll be able to see what the U.S. context looks like, and then what we're actually seeing for data. And these are, these are some data from current studies that I'm involved with. So this is the first pie chart that I'd like to focus on. And this is just an estimate of the population in 2013. On the left-hand side, you have uh, the United States. And on the right-hand side, you have North Carolina. So about 9 million people living in North Carolina in 2013. And you can see that our number of uh, Caucasian or white residents um, was mirrored largely what the U.S. looks like. So the U.S. represents 62.6 and um, North Carolina was at 64.4. You can see that North Carolina has a bit of a higher um, percentage of people who identify as black or African American, and a slightly lower um, percentage of folks that identify as uh, Latino or Hispanic. And you can think about that in where we're located. If we were in California or Texas or Florida, we would have a higher Hispanic population, Latino population. 
Um, but we're in the southeast, and so that's not quite as high, although Charlotte is one of the fastest growing um, regions or areas for um, Hispanic and Latino folks. Um, and you can see that our, our black or African American number is slightly higher than the national average. Now I'd like for us to transition and look at what um, the demography or what the data look like in the school system. So again, these are federal data and these are produced by um, the U.S. Department of Education. Again, on the left you have the U.S. and on the right you have North Carolina. And now you can see that our pie slices, our white pie has decreased slightly, mm -hmm. um, and the black pie and the Hispanic Latino pie have increased slightly. And what you have, on, you have two things going on in this slight shift. Um, the first is that um, the older population in North Carolina is whiter, and the younger population includes more people of color. So one is just um, basically a, a number shift in the, in the general demography. But the other thing that's a little bit more interesting to my research is that you have um, an overrepresentation in independent schools, mm -hmm. parochial schools, um, depending, these are public schools, so depending on whether your charter and magnets are under the public school mm -hmm. umbrella or not. Um, and then homeschooled. In those pockets, they tend to be overrepresented um, with white sure. young people. Um, and so you see our pie kind of shift a little bit and here. And that's an issue that's obviously especially relevant here in Charlotte where you have high concentrations of economically disadvantaged students and black or African American students in urban center schools and many white students, as you said, uh, moving to private schools or charter schools. Right, and, and you can actually see um, Dr. Amy Hahn Nelson here mm -hmm. at UNC Charlotte has done some beautiful work around um, mapping um, the um, social, I mean, the uh, racial isolation mm -hmm. and um, the basically um, in what integration or segregation right. looks like in the schools. Right. Um, and, you know, not always are those, are the economically disadvantaged students um, black students right. and vice versa. Right. So, um, but now I would love for us to look at education again, but let's look at some of the school discipline issues mm -hmm. that we know are happening um, in North Carolina and, and across the U.S. This is a slide which represents um, children who have received in-school suspension for a disciplinary offense. So some, some behavior that, that they've done presumably um, has gotten them into some trouble, and you begin to see the pie really shift at this point. Um, again, this was the um, school enrollment with 52% white, 26% black, and 13-ish percent um, Hispanic or Latino. And now with one uh, or more in-school suspension, your pie, your white pie yeah. shrinks to 38.5, your black pie swells to 43 and a half, and then you've got the Hispanic Latino number hovering right around 10 to 12 percent. Creeping up close to double representation there for the African American Correct. students. Correct. And it, be, it gets even more egregious when we look at out of school suspensions, and this figure is for children who have had more than one out of school mm -hmm. suspension. You've got your pie now at 27 percent white, 57 percent black, and again, you've got about that, that 10% um, Hispanic or Latino. So, you know, at this point, I'm often asked the question, um, are children of color committing more mm -hmm. crimes or more severe crimes than white children? Um, and, and what we see uh, consistently throughout different types of measures, through self-report measures, um, through discretionary and mandatorily reported offense measures. Um, so through a triangulation of the different data sources that we have, we find co the consistent answer is no, um, that white kids and black kids commit about the same amount of crime proportionate to their mm -hmm. representation um, in the population. So there was a, a groundbreaking study conducted out of the state of Texas in which um, the Council of State Governments looked at almost a million youth 
um, which as a statistician kind of makes me all jittery because there's some wickedly uh, sophisticated analyses that you can run with that many right. cases. What they were able to determine was that only about 3% of um, the offenses that happen at school are for what we would call mandatorily reported offenses. In the state of North Carolina, we have 16 that we've identified as mandatorily reported. And those will be the more severe offenses typically? Well, you know, typically, but it does vary some. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have some low-level um, illicit substance mm -hmm. charges in addition to if you brought a weapon to school, right. for example. Um, but nevertheless, you know, the Department of Public Instruction um, and the legislature have 16 um, offenses that they consider mandatorily reported. Um, if a young person shows up and you're the principal of the school, you have no choice but to call mm -hmm. that, that offense into Raleigh the same day. Well, what we find for those mandatorily reported offenses, and this is both nationally and in North Carolina, we find that, and that's again about 3% of all offenses, that those are largely proportionate. Mm -hmm. So the number of youth charged with offenses mirrors their proportion in the population. The problem is that that leaves 97% of all school-based offenses that are not mandatorily reported. And for those, they increase in their level of discretion or subjectivity, mm -hmm. and likewise, they're statistically significantly um, more likely to be disproportionate. In this study um, in particular, black students were found to have a 31% higher likelihood of a disciplinary action. We saw in-school suspension and out-of-school suspension as two of those potential actions. Um, and that's a 31% higher likelihood when compared to otherwise identical white students. So same um, family structure, same income, same offense, um, same number of prior record, et cetera, only right. varying that one distinction So you've of isolated your race. that variable as the thing that has made a difference or apparently has made a difference in those cases. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so oftentimes um, people like to look at graphs that show by offense category. Um, and so often um, I'll get two comments when I present um, Daniel Lowson's research. Again, this is a, um, a national scholar who does school to prison pipeline work. First, they're struck by the low level of types of offenses. Now, clearly these aren't mandatorily reported offenses, um, but still they were worthy of suspension. Mm -hmm. So these are North Carolina figures um, and you can see that um, there's cell phone violations, dress code violations, um, offenses that were deemed as disruptive, mm -hmm. um, and then finally displays of affection. And in the front, you can see that the yellow category uh, represents the Caucasian or white students, and the red category uh, represents the African American or, or black students. And so, you know, this visually shows um, that it's the same behavior mm -hmm. that children are committing, yet very disparate outcomes. So I think the question that people are asking is, how is this happening? What's happening in people's minds uh, to make these numbers appear the way they do? Uh, do you have some research that illustrates that? Absolutely. So um, there's two mechanisms that we've begun to study. Um, the first being institutional racism because we're seeing the effects across systems. Numbers look the same. I've showed you education and, um, and justice mm -hmm. numbers, um, but child welfare numbers look the same. Um, um, CMPD's numbers mm -hmm. look the same, et cetera. And so we've, we found institutional racism is a factor. The other thing that we found is implicit bias. An implicit bias is really a brain heuristic um, where people make decisions um, based on a host of information. Um, there was a Malcolm Gladwell book mm -hmm. not so long ago called uh, Blink. Right. It talked a lot about how people make snap, snap judgments or decisions, sometimes based on great data and experience that they have, and some based on um, less than great data, for example. Um, and a, a brilliant scholar out of, um, she was trained at Harvard and Yale, 
and she teaches now at Stanford. Jennifer Eberhardt has put together um, some amazing work, which I would love to show mm -hmm. you. Basically, uh, she conducted a study and she used um, Stanford and Berkeley students to, as her test subjects. She divided the test subjects into three groups and she showed them pictures like the ones that you can see on your screen. It took her 41 frames, if you will, to get a clear picture of mm -hmm. the objects that she was showing. And she had two kinds of objects. She showed you crime relevant objects and they were, like the example on the screen, gun, a knife, or handcuffs. Mm -hmm. She also showed pictures of crime irrelevant objects. So they were a stapler, a cup and a saucer, bugle, things like that. Right. For the three test subjects, one received no priming. So there were no subliminal pictures shown in between the frames of the objects. Right. So these are pictures that our brain can process at some level, but it's not at a level that we are actually conscious that we're seeing anything. Exactly. So after every single test subject, she asked, did you see pictures of anything else besides mm -hmm. these frames? They're shown at actually 31 milliseconds. It's, it's really interesting right. work. Um, no, they weren't able to detect them, but part of our brain, our subconscious, is detecting them. Mm -hmm. um, and so for the two test groups who, uh, that were primed, one uh, group was primed with faculty and staff and students' pictures who were white, and the other group were primed with faculty, staff, and students' pictures, photographs, um, who were black. And this is what she found. She found for the group that had no pictures in between the frames, or the no prime group, they were able to identify the pictures for the crime irrelevant objects in about 23 frames. So that's essentially your control group. Exactly, no prime. exactly. For the individuals who were primed with white faces um, and asked to identify crime irrelevant objects, it was about the same, about 24 frames before they could identify um, the objects. And for those that, who were shown black faces, they were able to identify, again, in about 23 frames. For the no prime group, when they were shown crime relevant objects, they did it in about the same number of frames that it took them to identify the crime irrelevant objects. Which is objects. reasonable. That's reasonable. what you would expect. That's exactly what you would expect. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm sure there are smart people out there who would expect the next two results, but they took me by surprise. For the white primed, for the test uh, group that was primed with white faces, it took them longer to identify crime relevant objects. In other words, it inhibited their ability mm -hmm. to pick out the gun, the knife, or the handcuffs. For the last test group, which were primed with black faces, they were actually able to identify the crime relevant objects quicker when shown black faces. Notably so, quicker too. And I have no, to tell you, I was shocked the first yes. time I saw that. Statistically significantly. So this really begins to highlight some neurobiology that we're only beginning to understand. And that is the accumulation of brain heuristics um, and things that prime us to make decisions, um, either slowing us down to recognize whites and their relation to crime relevant, or um, speeding up our ability or our judgments towards black and crime. So if, if these things are, being, are influencing our brains in ways that we really can't control at a certain level, how do we combat this? Well, that is an excellent question. Um, one part of combating it is recognizing it. Mm -hmm. um, explicit bias is easy because we know that we have a bias against someone. And in situations where we're trying to be politically correct, we curb those opinions or we keep them to ourselves. However, when our brain is not conscious of those um, biases that we have in the, in, in the instances of implicit bias, then we're not able to see that. Um, and so some, there's some cutting edge work being done nationally um, and then regionally as well. So one of the local teams that's focused on dealing with some of the issues that we've highlighted today is Race Matters for Juvenile Justice. And you've been involved with their work, done some community outreach. 
Can you talk about what that organization is and what you're trying to do? Absolutely. So um, as, as I mentioned in our, in our time together today, I spent some time looking at this phenomenon, um, disproportionality or overrepresentation in the juvenile justice system when I was in, in the state of Virginia for years, for a decade and didn't see much shift. Both, uh, two things happened actually. Our understanding nationally of the phenomenon changed. Um, and then when I came to North Carolina, Race Matters for Juvenile Justice had just started. Um, and I was privileged to be part of that group's kickoff. Um, the goal of Race Matters, um, the mission of that organization, is really to um, erase things like institutional racism and implicit bias in systems so that we're not able to predict who gets diverted or who gets incarcerated based on the color of their skin. Um, back to that, that image of Lady Justice and that she should work based on the evidence um, and not lifting up her blindfold to see what you look like or, or what category um, you fit into. So that's the mission of, of the organization and the vision. The, the, the group has brought together stakeholders um, to do a couple things, to examine their data. And when I say stakeholders, um, it's a really unique uh, group of folks. Um, it started um, with the judiciary and some national um, initiatives that they were doing at the time and really has brought together all of the stakeholding groups that you would hope would right. be at the table to talk around youth and outcomes um, for the young people, sure. education, um, social work, um, CMPD. The CMPD. We've got um, our one of our biggest and best partners has certainly been law enforcement, um, and we're thankful, thankful for that. Um, and so the initiatives that uh, we focus on are workforce development and race analysis. One way that you can begin to um, address and recognize your own implicit biases are to have them pointed out mm -hmm. for you to um, take an implicit association test, um, which is how we can begin to unpack what your brain is doing or how it's responding to decision making. Um, and law enforcement, um, the judges have been involved in work around um, the judiciary is using a bench card to um, ask themselves some questions around race and ethnicity on protective hearing decisions that they're making. Um, in addition, we have caucusing that happens. Um, we have young people that are involved in the work, so we have some initiatives um, with the youth. And then we have institutions who want to examine and do a deeper dive on their outcomes mm -hmm. Um, to figure out what's going on. Um, I'm also very, um, very proud to say that the Chancellor's Diversity um, Challenge Grant has funded some research here at the university um, and paid for members of staff and faculty to attend um, this race analysis and anti-racist um, understanding. The idea being that we can build a community here at the university um, and there were um, several college deans who support that effort as well in getting their staff and faculty trained to recognize implicit bias and then the institutional outcomes that might be happening mm -hmm. um, on campus and in the region. Well, Dr. McCarter, thank you so much for coming in today to talk about this really important research that is extremely relevant uh, to our local community. And if people want more information, they can find that at racematters.org. That's the website for your organization. It's www.rmjj.org. Or they're welcome to contact me here at the university. Excellent. Well, thank you again for being here. Thank you for the opportunity. For Social Work Professor Susan McCarter, I'm Will City. Tune in next week for the Livewire at 12 noon on Friday.